that shopping funnel is just going to collapse. And you can create these moments of inspiration and you can move from kind of awareness to conversion and buy in lots of different means across lots of different properties, frankly, and a click and a click of a button. And so that's where the real power of shoppable media and the evolution to how we're delivering against consumer expectations really sits at the forefront. You're listening to Retail Remix, your inside access to candid conversations with the people shaping retail's future. Here's your host, Alicia Esposito. The marketing and advertising space is evolving rapidly, whether it's new privacy and security regulations, new platforms, or even retailers starting their own media networks. It's truly enough to make the most sophisticated marketers head spin. To better break down what's happening in this world of retail media networks and retail advertising, I wanted to sit down with two people who are living and breathing it day to day. So I sat down with Milan Mahadevan, who's the president of 8451, as well as Kara Pratt, Senior Vice President of Kroger Precision Marketing at 8451. And to those of you who don't know, 8451 is a division of the Kroger company, and they are focused on all things data. Data driven decision making, data driven customer experiences, and in this case, data driven marketing and advertising. And we get into everything what's happening in the retail advertising space as a whole, how new privacy regulations and perceptions of data use in marketing is impacting their approach, and of course, how the convergence between digital and physical will drive future innovation in retail media networks. If you've been keeping a close eye on this trend and you want to hear how 8451 is innovating in this area, this is an episode you cannot miss. Listen in. Milan, Kara, thanks so much for taking the time today. It's great to meet you and great to have you on the show. Thanks so much for having us. So uh, to start, why don't we begin by you introducing yourselves and and sharing a little bit about your respective roles, because you're you're both in a a very exciting company and space. Milan, how about we start with you? Cool. Thanks very much. So my name is Milan Mahadevan. I'm president of 8451. And so my role is predominantly you know, supporting our, our teams to be their best in the business. We're a wholly owned subsidiary of the Kroger company. And so we really focus on bringing data science to you know every part of the customer experience, whether that's in the media components to it, merchandising, operations with the core Kroger organization, but also beyond to also supporting brands and how they reach their customers. And I focus predominantly on ensuring that data science, the technology, all ladders up to support everyone across the Kroger organization. Great. Kara? Yeah, Kara Pratt, Alicia, thanks for having us. I lead our media practice, known to the market as Kroger Precision Marketing. We launched four years ago in October of 2017. Practically what that means, I I own our commercial go-to-market, product, tech, ops, and media execution for how we help brands connect with customers and kind of create moments of delight, make advertising work harder. Excellent. So for a bit of background and I guess clarity for myself and for our audience. So it seems like Kroger is the larger company and then there's 8451 and then Kroger Precision Marketing. So how do these two entities work together? How do they support each other? I just want to make sure I understand the the full context. Sure, I'll I'll take that one. This is Bill again. A51 is a, is a wholly owned subsidiary of the Kroger company, and we think of ourselves as the heart of data science for the, the Kroger organization. KPM is the retail network, retail marketing, retail advertising, retail media network for the Kroger company. And KPM sits with A451 because the data science component and the importance of data, understanding consumers, and the kind of machine learning techniques that we are developing and how those help power that KPM business. Excellent. And selfishly, I really wanted to have you folks on the show because I know in our areas of coverage, our conversations with the industry at large, there has been 
so much buzz, so many conversations surrounding retail advertising, how it's evolving, and the emergence of retail media networks, um, especially over the, I want to say, past six months or so. So I want to ask, I mean, what made 8451 decide to get into this space? Because we, we know, obviously, 8451 is always trying to think through what's next and how organizations can innovate through the customer experience. So why this particular area? I love that question, Alicia. And it's such an exciting time in the industry. And by that, I mean both the retail industry as well as the media industry. It's an incredibly dynamic time. And what I am most proud of as we think about the opportunity we have to continue to kind of create these moments of delight and leverage the power of our data science to help advertisers create those connections with customers, we're doing it with the same commitment when we launched four years ago. And that's a core commitment to media accountability. So why did we get into this space? We absolutely knew the power of our data, the power of our connection to commerce, and our ability to close the loop between who sees an ad and how does that change behavior would allow us to bring a new rigor of accountability to media and media investments. And as we think about fast forwarding four years to today and certainly where we see the future going, that commitment's only strengthening. We're making advertising more effective. We're making advertising more transparent. And we're doing that really in in two core ways. One, helping advertisers reduce waste, uh, and that's all really anchored in better audience targeting. What are the unique data signals uh, that we have by connecting all the transactional behavioral intelligence of consumers to not just a customer identifier, but a device identifier to create that moment of connection? And then the second bit on transparency is measurement. How do we bring more relevant metrics that matter to the forefront? Uh, How do we share with advertisers impact on on, uh, sales lift, on category shifts, on share of voice and share of 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 category consumption? So we decided to get in this space four years ago, really anchored in media accountability, and it's continuing to sit at the forefront. Kara, I really appreciate your your emphasis on transparency, and I have a feeling we'll be getting a bit more into that point, especially around those metrics that you were referring to. But first, I I do want to just clarify. So when you say advertisers, are you seeing or focusing largely on brands that may work with Kroger, the retailer? I mean, what is this What is this ecosystem of users or, or potential partners look like right now? And do you foresee it kind of changing? Again, I just want to make sure that I'm understanding all of the uh, ins and outs effectively. Sure. Certainly at the heart of it is around the consumer packaged goods manufacturers with the intelligence we have on behavior, not just within categories, um, but across categories and the consumer dynamics that sit there. I'd share the that, you know, is there an opportunity to extend into non-endemics and other industry verticals? Yes. Are we very focused on the impact and influence for our commitment to media accountability and what we can commit to there? Absolutely. So the core focal point for us today is certainly within consumer packaged goods with some evaluations and explorations in non-endemics. And as we talk about who do we engage with, it's a phenomenal range of talent within the industry spanning from marketers directly, uh, their respective agencies, publishers, kind of ad tech companies. So we're really you know, touching all facets of that media supply chain. Fascinating. So I do have to ask, again, just given the heightened buzz, I guess you could say, surrounding media networks, evolving models or, or approaches to advertising, I'm wondering if there have been any big hop and topics or, or questions from these brands that you've been working so closely with, again, either through the internal marketing teams or through their agency partners. And have these been any points of inspiration as you've shaped your approach and, and your overall business models for this area of the business? Yeah, absolutely. It's no surprise to any of us that brands need every advertising dollar to work harder, and they're focused now more than ever on business outcomes. And this can get solved by creating shoppable moments. Uh, No matter when or where media is being consumed, whether it's through television, digital advertisement, social feeds, email, there is an opportunity for marketers to rethink their investments to create that connection. So marketers are focused on brand safety. 
They're focused on privacy. They're focused on purpose and personalization. And we built Kroger Precision Marketing to deliver in those areas, bringing our addressability to the forefront. How do we reach the right consumer? Making sure that that media touch point is really actionable. So especially in the digital domain, there's an ability to shorten the connection between an advertisement or content and commerce. And finally, bringing accountability back to the forefront. So measuring the impact that that ad has on the business. Excellent. So I'm glad you brought up this notion of shoppable moments because I myself, as a content person, I'm always intrigued by the influence and impact of content on that customer journey and ultimately how it drives intent to buy. So what audience insights or consumer behaviors have helped drive or or shape Kroger Precision Marketing and, and its services overall? Well, Mellon talked about the heartbeat of what 8451 enables for the Kroger organization really sits on data science and making sure that we're influencing customer touch points across a whole myriad of opportunities within our brick and mortar stores or on our websites and beyond. Data is the critical ingredient to enable our success. But the real fuel comes from the science that sits on top of that. That's influencing audience intelligence and channel optimization strategies that we allow uh, and enable and empower advertisers to leverage. So we talk a lot about there's a difference between having data and doing something meaningful with data, how we migrate from descriptive to predictive to prescriptive analytics creates powerful recommendations. No matter if a brand's trying to drive awareness for kind of new to the world or new to the category product or trying to convert lapsed buyers in a mature brand to re-engage with the, the brand or the category. So it's known for us that media mix budgets follow consumer behavior. So we're focused on creating these, these shoppable moments or moments that matter across the media ecosystem. So how has it influenced the kind of trends or development of our services. To be successful, we needed to create connections across publishers off our properties, right? We have relationships with Roku, Pinterest, Pandora, Facebook, and others. They, consumers are going to those properties to consume content, and we can inspire when consumers are there, not in a disruptive way, but in a really helpful way. Uh, we also know that brands have an interest in influencing in a digitally constrained shelf, and so that is a whole separate kind of vertical that we've been evolving over the last four years within our owned and operated properties, our website, our app, uh, through our email channel. So it definitely, lots of different factors have influenced decisions that we've made in our first few years in the marketplace and no doubt continued change in consumer dynamics and how and where media is consumed will uh, continue to sit at the forefront to influence our strategy going forward. Yeah, that's great. I mean, it's definitely fascinating to see how the media ecosystem has evolved, what new channels and touch points have emerged, but also how they all kind of work together to fuel that customer experience and, you know, how you can start at one place, maybe go to another take some time off, go back to the thing, and how content and, you know, targeting capabilities and advertising all kind of work together to support that experience. But it it does lead me, of course, to a follow-up question around the ongoing conversations happening in the world of data privacy, how data is used to power advertising, and, you know, these more personalized content experiences. I know all of the marketers I knew were freaking out when the news of the elimination of the third-party cookie was announced. Obviously, we have a bit more time there, so that's good. But also with Apple changing its opt-out model to largely opt-in and and a lot of other privacy shifts that, that are happening in their world, I know that's been a big focal point for them as of late. So what kind of conversations have you been having in the data privacy and data use side of things? And how are these realities impacting the work that you all are are doing for the brand marketers and ultimately the consumers, right? Like it's all kind of interconnected. That's a great question, Alicia. Ultimately, yes, we talk about 
privacy. This is about trust. It's about building trusted relationships with consumers and shoppers based on giving them what they need, being loyal to them. And we're incredibly lucky to be part of the Kroger family. And the Kroger family has been there for customers. It's the largest traditional grocery store in the country and has been around for over 104 years. And so it has a deep relationship with consumers through delivering to it food delivering to people's needs. We've also obviously stood up a loyalty program, which means consumers are opting in directly to sharing that data. And it's incumbent upon us to give them back value. And that's what Kroger's loyalty program, which underpins how we receive data, creates trust with consumers. Because through that that loyalty program, we're able to build a deeper relationship with customers by being more relevant to them in the things that we show them, whether on our digital properties or not on our digital properties. We're able to present them with offers, you know, highly relevant savings, value. And no matter what the consumer's value proposition is, whether it's more health orientated, more convenience orientated, more more sense and dollars orientated, we're able to understand that through what they're willing to share with us and then present them with those highly relevant offers, which furthers that trusted relationship where they know that they're in a value exchange with us. And so we view a lot of this as, yes, it's about privacy. Yes, it's about protecting people's data assets. It's about doing right. But it's also about trusted relationships. And through that Lord's program, we're able to deliver upon those trusted relationships. Kara, do you want to add on to that? Yeah, I think the value exchange is critical. Millen's absolutely right. We don't stand on anything without consumer trust and using that information to kind of give back to them. However, they want to they, they want to kind of earn value back. From a media perspective, uh, that just further powers our first party data, which further powers the impact and influence we can have for advertisers as commerce and, and shopping behaviors continue to evolve and shift. Third party data is never been a really effective way for targeting. And I think that if we all kind of pause and reflect, I think we'd all likely come to a very similar conclusion that the industry's been built on incentivizing less important metrics with respect to the impact that media has in the long term. And uh, you know, we looked at a recent report from the Association of National Advertisers and saw a lot of power with how they're talking to the industry much more holistically about metrics that matter. In fact, in May, they released this report called Media KPIs That Matter. And it showed that marketers aren't getting access to the right information they need to make the most meaningful impact and influence to understand the effectiveness of their media. The most used KPIs are primarily looking at efficiency and exposure data, whether it's CPM or CPC, unique reach, impressions. But the most important are focused on business outcomes. Uh, That's getting into return on investment or return on ad spend, brand safety, consumer lifetime value, conversion. And so as we think about all of the kind of industry or kind of market dynamics that are influencing change, there's real power behind that. That done right puts more control and more value back to advertisers with, with the choices that they're making on how they spend their critical investments to drive brand growth. Both of you, so, so many fantastic points. Millen, I, I have to say up front, I, I have to agree fullheartedly about the impact and importance of creating that mutual value exchange between the consumer and the brand and retailer, right? It's, it's about being clear and transparent about what data is being used and how and ultimately how that will benefit the customers in the long run. It seems like over the years, as we've been covering personalization and even loyalty programs, that those points surrounding transparency and communication always seem to come back up to the forefront. So it definitely seems like those are fundamentals in ensuring that brands and retailers are successful in whatever they do as far as, you know, using data to their advantage. And and Kara, I really love your point about metrics and transparency around performance and impact of these experiences. And it leads me to a follow-up question that I have around who is more involved or becoming more involved in these conversations around impact and performance of these campaigns? Because 
sometimes I feel like the issues or the concerns of marketing teams are sometimes in a vacuum, right? Like marketing is, is in control of marketing, but I, I'm seeing glimmers of different teams being involved in these conversations. And of course, the C-level putting a closer magnifying glass on marketing specifically because they want to understand, to your point, the impact of these programs and and these initiatives and and how they're driving more tangible and and in some cases bottom line results for the business. And and I'm curious if you're seeing a a similar shift or, or similar evolution in terms of who's thinking about performance, who's thinking about data privacy or consumer perception of data privacy of these types of initiatives. Like, is this something that is slowly but surely extending into other functions and other areas of the business? Yeah, I think it's very clear that this is not a marketer's problem to solve, if you will. And and to your point, it extends whether the influence and level of involvement of chief data officers, chief investment officers at at digital agencies, chief customer officers, chief financial officers, it continues to move through lots of different really critical C-suite functions for, for everybody being mindful of this. For brands that try to solve this in a silo or organizations really that try to solve this in a silo, they're going to come up short because it's not just around marketing effectiveness. It really breeds off of the the transformation that's taking shape for how and when people shop, right? The digital transformation, omni-channel expectations that customers have, and of course, privacy is a common thread throughout all of it. Uh, And that feeds into how organizations kind of organize, structure themselves to then influence where investment comes from? How do they operationalize their strategy? So this is not a a single kind of functions opportunity to solve, but many different kind of layers within the organization have a responsibility to to lean in and dig in together. And, you know, Millen, I'm sure you've got lots of thoughts on this too. Yeah, 100%. I mean, I think this isn't about an individual team within a brand or even a retailer it's about all of those teams come together and having an intense focus on you know the customer and intense focus on kind of return around it and so we've seen i would say every part of the, an organization lean into understanding and influencing how whether it's media dollars advertising dollars marketing dollars are used to reach customers and to drive a return excellent so that leads me to ask i mean how will these conversations evolve or the teams evolve as we start to think about the future. And by the future, I mean, Kara, to your point around the omni experience and the the potential of bringing these more connected and immersive media and content experiences to the store level. I know we're starting to see little rumblings of like store as media and store of the future and how digital content and personalization is a really strong connecting point for that. So what are you seeing in in that particular area? We see a real collapsing from, I think, historical mindsets where there's kind of a fractured or separation historically in, you know, digital versus traditional channels, digital versus physical retail touch points, et cetera. So that that shopping funnel is just going to collapse. And you can create these moments of inspiration and you can move from kind of awareness to conversion and buy in lots of different means across lots of different properties, frankly, in a click and a click of a button. And so that's where the real power of shoppable media and the evolution to how we're delivering against consumer expectations really sits at the forefront. Omnichannel commerce is going to continue to evolve the touch points within a physical store and the digital means of being inspired uh, when somebody's kind of shopping in a physical store, yet kind of using an app when they're in that moment to not just using that for influencing pre-trip planning or adding coupons and offers and incentives Incentives, meal planning recipes and inspiration, et cetera, but helping to navigate in the store. There's so many opportunities for the physical world and the digital world to collide and be really helpful to help consumers live healthier lives, make better decisions, and, and just make things easier in a, in a relatively chaotic environment. So what I really love about the landscape is the change is being driven both by the consumer and consumer expectations, as well as the market and net new regulations 
regulations and ad tech evolutions. And I think one tenant that we fundamentally believe in is consumer expectations are only going to grow. They're going to get higher. Immediacy, convenience, that's the way of the future. And we're just at the beginning of it. And so we, we see a lot of exciting evolution within the landscape as the physical and digital worlds collide. Millen, any builds on that? I thought you, you answered it beautifully. That collapsing component and that path to purchase and the role the store plays, the role digital play, it's, it all will blur because it's all about the customer and where are they in their, in their experience, in their journey. As a retailer, Kroger is going to continue to really focus on personalization. Offline, online, it's one seamless experience for the consumer. And Kara, talk to the, the blurring of free shop, during shop, so many capabilities that are started in a pure play digital space are being taken at pace to the physical environment. You know, if you go and you engage with, with Kroger in a digital environment, you kind of get to this place of, have you forgotten? And that type of capability can be available as you walk through the store. And it's about being not just relevant, but useful to the consumer. Because one of the worst things you can have as a consumer is to, is to leave the store, get home, unpack, and realize you forgot something. And so, so many of these experiences, whether they're inspiration, whether they're convenience, whether they're just useful, their value plays, can be placed across the spectrum of the assets of the business to really help all customers wherever they are in their journey. And I actually think it's going to be super exciting to see that evolution continue to get more and more of those touch points that have traditionally been in more of a, a digital environment exposed in that more physical environment. It's only just a matter of time as they really take over. For a consumer, it'll be a case of go from a mobile app to my, my digital car and helping me navigate the store in one really seamless manner and alerting me to you know things that I might have forgotten on my trips so that I don't get home and feel disappointed in that experience. Experience. Yeah, I have to say, Melon, I, I kind of cringed to myself as you were talking about going to the grocery store, coming home and realizing you forgot to get something. It is such a, a common issue. And to your point, being able to get those notifications or those friendly reminders of like, oh, hey, you bought this last time. Are you sure you don't need it this time? Like I could imagine like as you're going through the store aisles that those types of touch points or those interactions could be extremely valuable for a lot of customers. But as we talk holistically about the convergence of channels, the merging of digital and physical, it leads me down this rabbit hole of, okay, well, what does this mean for the future of measurement, especially as we look at the performance or value of specific stores and if there's going to be a merging of you know some of the KPIs that we were talking about or an evolution in attribution right because like I'm wondering if there's going to be a store level impact of like okay well this store had this campaign and this performed this way and this other store here like I'm wondering if there's going to be an interesting new level or or new evolution in in omni-channel measurement as we see these media experiences being brought into the store. And I don't know, I could have just gone on a, a crazy tangent with no weight whatsoever, but I, I'm curious if you guys are thinking about what that long tail of change in measurement and KPIs could mean as, as these blending of channels continue to happen. 100% there will be a vast evolution of how we measure. Today, we actually also, we do already measure kind of the attributable sales in the physical environment as well, because there are lots of people that go to your digital properties uh, to be inspired, to find new. And then when they're going to transact, they still go to the store. And so that continuous evolution of when we create that point of stimulation, whether it's inspiration, whether it's these things you might like that you haven't purchased before, whether it's just a, a call to action around potential value as a customer that you're leaving on the table and you have that opportunity. We want to see how that not only impacts within that digital commerce transaction, but how it impacts uh, the consumer more holistically. We are an omni-channel retailer and KPM is an omni-channel media platform. So we want to hit 
consumers, you want to help them across the spectrum. And so those ways of measuring and the transparency back to the brands needs to evolve with it, where we're not just looking at sales, we're looking at real lift, we're looking at real engagement, and we're looking at that across channels, uh, because omni channels being talked about a lot. But I think KPM is actually blazing a trail on what it really means and how your dollars drive an impact to the consumer level, irrespective of channel. I'll ask Kara to add on to that. Yeah, really well said. Uh, I think the only build I'd have is we want to make sure that how we're leveraging our data is uh, most powerful back to an end media buyer, an end marketer. And that means that we're going to share associated data that prioritizes context to the media efficacy and not just around the traditional media metrics that we talked about before and that, frankly, the ANA shined a spotlight on saying, hey, this isn't enough anymore. Uh, the industry has evolved tremendously and we should expect more. Let's really focus on brand outcomes. Of course, it's all anonymized and it's aggregated and customer privacy will will sit at the forefront of, of all of that. But how do we help brands really understand a much lower grain connecting physical and digital impact of an ad to really understand that the net impact that uh, that creative had, that that type of advertisement within that different channel had to change behavior. And ultimately, that is the most important. I think the evolution is going to continue. The rigor around multi-touch attribution studies or looking at mixed models in different ways. I've got all of the respect uh, for our data scientists and the evolution that the industry is going to continue to push forward on. That's only possible through access to depth and breadth of well-structured data. And, and the reality is, is most, most retailers and publishers don't have access to the right information to do that at scale. And we're really grateful for the opportunity that we have to lead the market in this way. So to that end then, and, and I agree, Kara, I mean, the, the work that data scientists do every day is, is just truly fascinating to me, and, and, and it's commendable how they're pushing the industry overall forward. But as far as 8451 specifically, I mean, what are your forward-looking focal points? What are you prioritizing? What innovations are you really bringing to the forefront? Because like I said earlier, there's heightened interest and accelerating conversations around this space. We're seeing new offerings come up to market faster and faster, it seems like. And for us, it's very interesting to see who's doing what, why, and how. But based on our conversation today, it, it seems like this has been in the works and, and has been tinkered with and refined and, and optimized on, on your side for, for quite some time. So where are you focusing your efforts and where do you think this space is going and how are you kind of bringing those two worlds together to ensure that you're you're evolving or even staying a few steps ahead of where everyone else is going in this world? I'll talk broadly about 8451 and then Kara can jump in on the media and marketing side a little bit more detail. But I think Kara said this earlier. It's about data. And it's about uh, diverse data, breadth of data. And so we continue to focus on how do we develop core data assets through you know, the fact that we're part of that Kroger family that enables us to understand consumers. We want to continue to extend that data asset from just you know, first party data to almost, almost zero party data where the consumer is, is participating in giving us verified data as well, not just the transaction data that we collect through our loyalty program, which covers you know, 96% of all our business, so incredible coverage, but also enable the consumer to give us more kind of verified preference data, what was relevant to them. And then the second is, is how you make sense of all that data, because having data is one thing, but what you do with it is incredibly important. And being able to, to work through the myriad of different variables, the derived data you can create over the top of it, is all about machine learning. It's about data science. It's about how you interpret that data in a way that enables you to understand the consumer, understand their likelihood to X, and then be able to present that back to the consumer, whether in a store or through a channel, a digital channel of some description, and then see what they do and close that loop and understand the various impacts of those stimulus on the consumer. What was really relevant? How many touch points did it require to, to have them respond? What was the context in which they saw that and in which they made a decision, whether it's seasons or it's time of shop or a certain price point or a certain moment in their shopping trip as they were traversing the store 
store or traversing building their basket online. So it's a data play to build up that richness of data. It's not just the data we can collect, but it's what we can invite our consumers to share with us based on that trusted relationship that we have. And then it's making sense of all of it. Making sense of it in a, a completely ethical way, but making sense of it all uh, to be able to actually do something with it that then closes that loop. And so the innovation around you know data creation is going to be massive across every industry. The innovation around data science, how you make sense of it. And then finally, the innovation around measurement or the innovation around closing the loop attribution methodologies to really understand the impact uh, that helps brands and helps retailers understand how do we put this package together to be as relevant as we can to consumers and to deliver the best return to brands. The builds that I'd have specific on media is there's no doubt that we have and we will continue to invest in the ad tech platform that we have. That is critical, right? How do we kind of unleash the science that Melon just talked about that's so critical to drive the right value equation for advertisers? You do that at scale through the appropriate platform and kind of connections into different content publishers. We also will invest in operations and continue to do so, right? That is really around the effectiveness and the efficiency for how we can how we can help brands create those connections as quickly as possible right so they can create and curate these experiences and understand the value equation of that and, and continue to optimize in real time so there's no doubt that ad tech and ops all need to kind of work together and, and organizations need to invest holistically in both we have we will continue to we'll make choices on what's important for us to build ourselves because the unique kind of assets that we have and and we want to continue to protect the IP that we have around that. Where might we want to partner with somebody else that has something already built that we can move faster with? A degree of commoditization is a part of that. And from an acquisition standpoint, what would it be important for us strategically, not short term, but long term? And so all of those kind of factor in as we take, you know, three steps back and look at where's the industry going and strategically, what are the choices that we need to make to create an environment that matters most to advertising? and create the right business outcomes for them. Truly fascinating. Um, Kara Millen, thank you again so much for taking the time out to share a little bit about the work 8451 is doing and the progress of the media and, and advertising services. It's it's truly a fascinating space. But before I let you go, I always try to close out these conversations with a tactical takeaway or two, um, especially when we're covering a new and exciting space such as this one. I feel like it's sometimes difficult for people to get to the heart of the issues and, and fully understand how can and should move forward and and find the right partner, the right tech, or or the right approach for their business. Obviously, I'm I'm sure you've had quite a number of conversations with brand partners, with advertising agencies. Do you have any closing tips or, or pointers for the folks listening right now that want to be innovators in the space, want to test things out, and either are worried about taking the leap or don't know where to start or where to go. Again, it's such an evolving space. I could imagine it's easy for folks to feel a bit overwhelmed. No doubt. Listen, this is this is just an exciting moment for brands and a critical moment, frankly, to kind of lean in and kind of recognize the change that's happening with shopping habits. Uh, that's under an incredible amount of disruption. And brands that sit on the sidelines and watch that happen are just, they're just going to fall behind. And so what are some threats that we see brands facing day in and day out? We talked a lot about accountability. There's challenges. There's meaningless measurement that sits out there. They've got to sift through that and be an active voice, be a change agent to the industry. There's a challenge for brands. They need to influence a digitally constrained shelf. Uh, They need to influence as e-commerce habits are being formed. And they need to break through siloed planning that historically has happened within organizations. So what are some of the best practices we see? Brands have an opportunity to jump in and lean in and take advantage of some of the consumer trust that retail retailers have and the connection to commerce that we have. We have an opportunity to br- build solutions. Advertising shouldn't be disruptive for disruptive sake. It should inspire. It should create that connection. It should be meaningful. And we can do that through building bridges with great content providers by leveraging data science at scale 
on our owned and operated properties, and by working in a really collaborative way with agencies, with brand marketers, and others within the media ecosystem for brands and build these plans across silos. Don't don't sit in kind of an anchor point of kind of questioning the value of a, a shopper dollar versus a, a brand building dollar versus an e-commerce dollar and a trade promotion dollar. Let's think holistically about investment and how that investment hits the customer and impacts the customer. So those are the recommendations that we have on, you know, no doubt it is a challenging time when you look at it one way and it's a really opportunistic time for brands to kind of engage and leverage the, the value that retail media can bring to the market. Excellent. Well, again, Kara Millen, thank you again so much for taking the time out. It's, it's truly exciting stuff and I appreciate you digging into it with me, walking through all of your priorities, your investments, how you're approaching the evolving retail media networks um, space. It was truly a pleasure to get to speak with you today. Thank you again. Likewise. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks for having us. And to all of you, hope you enjoyed today's conversation. Again, this is a space we're keeping a close eye on as it continues to evolve and accelerate. Would love your thoughts on today's episode. So drop us a line on Twitter at rtouchpoints or on LinkedIn at Retail Touchpoints. And if you like this episode and want to spread the word, drop us a review on your preferred podcast player. Drop us a few stars and a few comments. Um, The more comments we get, the more likely we will show up in those recommendations. So our goal is to always spread the word. So if you can do that, we would appreciate it. And of course, if you haven't subscribed to the pod already, we're on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, frankly, anywhere else you listen to podcasts, we're likely there. If you subscribe, you will get a new episode delivered directly to your preferred device every Monday when a new conversation is launched. Thanks again to you, Kara and Millen, and thanks to all of you. We'll see you next time. Take care. Thanks for listening to this episode of Retail Remix. Be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. You can find us on your favorite podcast player. Until next time, keep mixing it up.